Please turn with me to James, uh, pardon me, please turn with me to John chapter 12, and I begin reading with verse 12. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him, when he called Lazarus out of his grave, and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. As John records his gospel for us, he is recording from a space of 40 or 50 years since these things have taken place. He is not writing, as it were, a newspaper reporter having just seen these things, but he gives comment as he goes along about the understanding as it was at the very moment and as they came to understand better and in a fuller sense. So we consider this as seeing but not perceiving. The disciples seeing what was right in front of them, but it really didn't latch onto them. It didn't grip them as it would in subsequent days. John, as he is laying out his gospel and ever so quickly leave it, leading us to the passion, here we are beginning Holy Week, as he is leading us to Christ's passion and his death upon Calvary, John points out to us that there were those who had loved Jesus and that love and that devotion would only grow and mature. And there were those who, in the very opposite direction, they had a distaste for Jesus. They had a dislike, and that would augment, that would exponentially grow in the opposite direction. John has been leading us through this, giving us hints through the gospel of how that these two polar opposites would go in even farther opposite directions. A key that would just add jet fuel to these was what takes place in John chapter 11 with the he not the healing, that, but the raising out of death itself of Lazarus. Lazarus is a very key person in the witness of Jesus' power. And of all the sign miracles that John records, turning water into wine, hot, he raising Jairus' daughter out of death, here we have that Lazarus, his raising from the dead, after he had been three days in death, was a most remarkable thing. The Jews of the first century had the notion that a spirit would linger around a body for a certain period of time, but that eventually that spirit would be gone and it would not be able to be recalled in any possible way. It was one thing for Jesus to raise 
a person out of death if they had just recently expired, but for Lazarus to have been three days dead. And as his sisters say, Lord, don't touch that stone. There is going to be a stench. There is going to be such putrefaction already. You don't want to go there. The raising of Lazarus would cause many to trust in Jesus. They would see what had taken place there and they would come to believe. We read in John chapter 12, the, the beginning of the chapter that we have read in the middle, six days before the Passover, Jesus comes to Bethany where Lazarus was raised from the dead. Mary takes a very costly ointment and anoints Jesus' feet and wipes his feet with her hair. And that aroma of that ointment just spreads and beautifies the whole house. In verse 9, we read, Much people of the Jews, therefore, knew that Jesus was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. The chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. The very life of Lazarus that he was living and breathing was a testimony of the power of Jesus Christ to make Lazarus what he was, alive, breathing, moving about, that there was a power that they could not understand or explain. So now we come to the feast. And as typically happened in Jerusalem, the city would swell with people who would come in order to celebrate the feast in Jerusalem. And there were much people that came to that feast and when they heard that Jesus was coming, they went to the trees where they could get a branch. They broke them off and they went forth to cry out, Hosanna or save us now. And they say, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord for us. Each year on Palm Sunday, we think about how these people welcomed Jesus as he approached Jerusalem and did this most uncustomary event, though not unknown. They were ecstatic. They were joyful. They wanted to welcome this one. Many of them had seen Jesus firsthand and heard the teaching and seen the miracles that he had effected. But many of them, they had just heard of it, and they were ecstatic that now perhaps they would hear him teach or that they would see one of the miracles that he would effect. All of the hopes of the Old Testament scriptures, the times when it spoke of how that God would bring his people out from under the boot of their oppressors, that they would have a hope and a future, all of these things coalesce and they come to vivid life for the people and they cry out, blessed is the king of Israel, the one who comes, we think in the name, well, that's in the power, in the authority, in the name, power, authority of the Lord, Jesus as is better explained to us in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus finds that young ass and he sits thereon, and the scripture is fulfilled, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. He does not come on a great stallion with a club in his hand and a sword at his side. 
He does not come with his legions of armies in order to overpower by force. He comes meek. He comes humbly. He comes lowly. He comes with an open hand, hands which they would drive nails into. His head was ungarnished. There was nothing there rather than a crown that ought to be placed upon it. It receives thorns. Into his hand is placed a scepter and around his shoulders is placed robes of lavish luxury, but they would quickly be snatched away and they were deceptive garments and a deceptive scepter. Scepters and garments of this world rather than of God's glory. He should have received and been endued with all of the praise of this world, but he would receive the mocking and the spitting, the scorn. But these people, they are a part of what God is open-handedly reaching out to them. You remember how that on the hills round about Bethlehem, in the nativity, that the angel came and the shepherds were horrified. They were terrified, as we consistently find when an angel appears in the scriptures. It isn't, oh, I've been waiting for you to get here. How are you doing? There is terror. There is a strike to the heart. Is this the result of God's judgment coming? But just as to the shepherds who are told, Fear not, for I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be to all the people. Here we have the word that is spoken to Zion, to Jerusalem. Even the very city that kills the prophets, who stones those who are sent to them with God's words and God's message, Fear not, fear not. This king who surpasses, who supersedes every other king, every other messenger, every other prophet who has ever been sent to you, yet fear not. He does not come with a club. He comes low and meek. The disciples, we read in verse 16, understood not at the first. There was a veil over their eyes. They just didn't get what God was up to, what God's full plan as it unfolded before them. They just didn't see it. They were as caught up as the rest of the crowd. Very much as the disciples and Jesus came to Samaria and they were rebuffed and the disciples said, should we call down fire? And Jesus says, no, you don't understand. You don't know of who you are and other illustrations, examples through the life of Jesus where the disciples just didn't get it. On the Sea of Galilee, when he calms the storm and they're asking the question to one another, who in the world is this? That even the wind and the waves obey him. They were right there. They saw him, but it did not sink in. They saw him right before their very eyes. John says, we even handled him. We touched him. But yet there was not that comprehension such as they should have had. At the first, they understood not. But, but later, when he was glorified, after the cross, and after the resurrection, when they started to dig in with new zeal to the scriptures, they understood with new understanding what was taking place, the Holy Spirit coming upon them and empowering them that the things of Christ might become vividly real to them. These things understood not the disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, now, we could say that Jesus was glorified in his obedience to come to Bethlehem to be born. And we could say that Jesus was glorified at the Jordan River when John said 
Jesus, I can't baptize you. I need to be baptized by you. But Jesus, he says, the most important thing is that the Father's will and the Father's plan be carried out in all of its detail. Let it be so, and so it was. Jesus, as he moved about and spoke words of life, he was glorified in heaven's books in all of that, but most especially what he did upon Calvary in his glorification. When Jesus was glorified in that most magnificent event, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done, in fact, these things to him. The word carried out in perfect detail. Verse 17. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. How wonderful it was to have these people. Bethany was essentially in Jerusalem's backyard, just a Sabbath day's journey away, not far. And so though there may have been there in Jerusalem some who would say, I was in Cana of Galilee. I was a guest of that wedding where Jesus, all of a sudden they were out of supplies and Jesus met the need. Or other events in Jesus' ministry and life. But here most especially, this crowning sign miracle of which many had seen they had been to Lazarus's funeral they had been there when they opened the tomb and the dead man was placed among his kin they had seen it all and they had also seen how that Jesus came and said please take away the stone they had heard Mary and Martha saying, Lord, hold on here. This is rather undignified. And they had seen when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, that the dead man came hobbling out of his grave and he said, loose him and let him go. So these people, they said, it's true. It's true what you have heard, and they bear record. Verse 18, for this cause the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. They heard the wonderful things that Jesus had done, and their hopes were pinned upon him. Every eye was set upon him. I think of those people, thinking of mums, I think of those people who broke off the branches and they not only waved those branches and they shouted, but so many of them took off their coats and cloaks and they laid them on the ground so that the colt could make its way along on this carpet of clothing that people would know that here is something most remarkable. I suspect there was a mum who, when either their husband or their kids got home and they saw the dirt on their cloaks, they said, where have you been? Have you been rolling in the dirt? How in the world am I supposed to get this out? For this cause the people met him, and they met him with joy. They met him with anticipation. They met him with expectancy. Oh, that our hearts would have such expectation that when we hear the word, that when we hear the name of Jesus, that there would be a jump and a leap in our hearts that there would be a joy such as nothing in this world could compare to. Now we have those who are gravitate toward Jesus and who are becoming even more devoted and enamored with him. 
though they do not yet understand the full plan and purpose of God. We have standing around those Pharisees who have, to the best of their ability, sidled up with the scribes and the Sadducees, who otherwise they would have precious little to do with in order that they might demean, that they might belittle Jesus. Well, the Pharisees, we have a glimpse into what their thoughts were about this disgusting display really meant. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing. You've lost the battle. And you've not just lost the battle. It seems that we're losing the war. We have tried to help these unschooled, untutored, unlearned people that Jesus is a deceiver, but they have ignored us rather than ignored him as we would want them to. They have not heeded our warning. And the world, it seems, it is going after him. Right after this, we find that there were certain Greeks. Undoubtedly, what John meant by that was Hellenistic Jews, Jews who had come from Greece and other places in order to worship at the feast. And these Jews, these Greeks, they come to Philip. Interesting that of all the disciples, they latch themselves on to the man who has the most Greek-sounding name and who was from a Greek community, Bethsaida of Galilee. But they desired to see Jesus, and they said, Sir, to Philip, they say, Sir, we would see Jesus. And Philip, he comes, and he tells Andrew, and Andrew and Philip, they come to Jesus. And Jesus... His response is, well, bring them over here. Let's, let's chat with them. But Jesus, rather, he says, the hour is come. It's time. God's plan, which has been set out in eternity past and has been marching forward according to the calendar of this world, but only known to the Father, it has been marching forward, and it is now time. It wasn't time for Jesus' full glory to be revealed in the miracle there at Cana of Galilee. Jesus, he said to his mother when his mom said, they've run out of wine, you know. And he says to her, woman, what is that to me? My hour is not yet come. But now, Jesus, he says, now, now, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be, in the fullest sense, glorified. And he speaks of his death, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much, much fruit. Jesus had come, and amid all of the confusion, amid all of the various interpretations of what could this be? Isn't this a great day? The king, we have a king now. But Jesus, rather than getting carried away with the enthusiasm of the crowd, he speaks of his own death, saying, The hour has come, and the Son is to be glorified. The disciples, they saw. The disciples heard. The disciples even touched Jesus. But they did not understand fully who he was and is, and what he came to accomplish. 
the disciples right up to the very conclusion of Christ's earthly life would be bickering about which of them was the strongest, which of them was the best, which of them was the closest, which of them was most suited for authority and for rule. They didn't get it. I wonder what that has to say of us seeing how many Palm Sundays have we passed through, how many Good Fridays, how many Easter's, seeing, singing the songs, reading the scriptures, hearing the messages that are repeatedly sent forth from the concluding chapters and verses of the Gospels, but yet unaware, as though a veil hangs over the face, and seeing, but not yet grasping. Oh, that the Holy Spirit would come and take the things of Christ and make them so powerfully real to each and every one. Lord, we look to you and we give you thanks and praise for how patient you are, how kind, how gracious. When your disciples were so desperately slow, and Lord, forgive us, should we be dull? Should we be seeing but just not getting it? Straining to hear but thinking in muddled terms? Continue your work, your gracious work, we pray, and help us, Lord. Work all that is pleasing in your sight and receive praise, honor, and glory both now and always. These mercies we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.